here today. And so, uh, for the past few months, people have been uh, asking me left and right, now, how is your internship over the summer? I mean, you learn a lot. And I've been giving some haphazard, uh, fast responses, but it's good to finally uh, jot it all down and present it formally today. And so, um, but before I get into talking about the internship itself, I'd like to give some uh, a broad information about the Eisenhower Library itself. So, the full name, the Eisenhower the Presidential Library Museum in Boyhood Home, is one of 13 presidential libraries that is maintained by a federal institution called NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration. Every U.S. president, from Herbert Hoover onwards, has one of these uh, libraries and museums. They retain all the um, they pertain all the personal documents, official uh, documents, government records, um, and any other kind of historical uh, historical documentation or artifacts that pertain to that sort of presidency. So um, the, the Eisenhower uh, Center, a, another term for the entire entity, is special in one regard is that it has it is the only presidential library that has the original childhood home of the president. So whenever you visit uh, Abilene uh, at some point, at some point in your life, you're decide to travel there. Uh, you can tour the original uh, home of the Eisenhower family, which uh, I got to tell you, it's actually uh, it's pretty intriguing. They actually the sidewalks that run along the uh, the Eisenhower home uh, emulate the original streets and roads that existed during that time before the. Uh, Grounds as well. So, so, but we can go ahead and start getting to the internship. The full name the title of the internship is the World War II Heritage Internship, and it's a program that's sponsored by a private group, the Eisenhower Foundation. And this foundation um, sponsors or supports um, historical research into the Eisenhower family and U.S. history, and they sponsor a lot of educational programs and workshops that help cultivate a um, appreciation of this particular history. So, and it's a private group that has um, receives lots of donations and is lots of uh, they fund a lot of these programs, such as the internship. So, um, and actually, just recently, the the four grandchildren of uh, President Eisenhower serve on the board of directors. Uh, Mary, Susan, and, and David Eisenhower all uh, serve this foundation. And this particular internship was focused on audiovisual work. This includes oral history interviews and army unit record photographs. And I'll explain both of those here in a little bit. The, the other interesting part of all internships, you don't just perform the duties that they tell you. you don't perform the duties that's you know, written in the job description. You don't have to do any other kind of work that's assigned to you. And so, Aside from uh, working with these uh, audiovisual records, I also helped with uh, educational workshops, recreational activities, um, and other sort of events that are occurring on the grounds. The, the main duties of the internship was accessioning, describing, and cataloging uh, oral history interviews from World War II veterans and um, other individuals who had a connection with connection with World War II, whether they served on uh, the home front, they worked in defense jobs, those who were in volunteer causes, such as Red Cross, and the other portion were Army unit records. And to define those, an Army unit record uh, consists of documentation pertaining to a particular military unit, and it includes everything from uh, rosters, casualty lists, maps, uh, orders and commands, and the portion that I worked with, uh, official photographs. They documented the events, people, uh, events, peoples, and places, and the actions that they performed. And these were all sort of really interesting photographs to work with. I went through probably you know, hundreds of these uh, Army unit record photographs, and they were kind of they were snapshots of everything going on in the European Pacific Theater from those specific unit perspectives. And of course, the overarching duty with both of these were drafting finding aids. Finding aids are really critical when you're doing uh, historical research. These help kind of narrow down and lead you down a path of what you're looking for when you're conducting research. 
But the main portion, the oral history interviews, these were all part of a larger project uh, conducted by a member of the Eisenhower Foundation, a uh, oral historian from the Oklahoma State Historical Society by the name of Joe Todd. And over a period of, I believe it was uh, at least six or seven years, he was uh, interviewing hundreds of World War II veterans uh, and others uh, across the majority of the Midwest. I think he completed around 900 interviews. And he interviewed people from Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Colorado, North and South Dakota, Nebraska, um, Idaho, and I believe one lady from California. So he, he did a significant amount of traveling and interviewed a large number of people. And they all had various backgrounds and connections with, uh, with the war. They either served in the Army, the Air Corps, uh, Marines, Navy, or they served in those home front capacities such as defense jobs or volunteer works. So around, during my time, I worked with approximately 80 interviews, and this was the last portion, or the last, last section of the entire World History Project itself, which brought around to around a little less than 900 interviews. And so it was, it was going on a long time before I arrived there, but it was a very substantial collection, and the Ascar Library definitely has gained a very valuable asset in these. And the interviews also covered not just uh, U.S. citizens, which I had originally anticipated, but there were uh, there were Japanese and Germans who were interviewed as well. They gave their perspective from their perspective of the war, and I'll explain uh, two of those here, actually here on the next slide. Of course, I'd be I'd actually be committing this huge disservice that I didn't explain or recount some of these uh, interviews that I interviews that I encountered. Uh, the first two, which were non-U.S. citizens, the uh, a woman who was born in Okinawa in 1936, she actually witnessed the um, U.S. forces approaching the island that appeared to become the Battle of Okinawa. She saw these ships pull in, uh, pull into the bay, and the uh, Marines moving on, moving on the shore. And she recalls that from a very early age, and still very vivid in her memory when she was uh, doing the interview. Uh, another gentleman who was actually um, a German citizen, he was enlisted in the German army during, this, during the war, and he served in the Wehrmacht. And during the interview, he uh, claims that he participated in the Nazi party rallies in Munich. And at one point in the interview, he says, oh, I was actually in Triumph of the Will, the, the film that they made about the, the Nazi party rallies. And you pause at this time, you can see me standing in this column, in this row, and there I am, second from the right. And it was a, it's kind of interesting to see that kind of interview be part of this collection, but it was good to have, um, it's good to have that kind of balance in there. But, and the other really, other interesting interview was a, a gentleman who served with the U.S. Navy Seabees. Um, the Seabees were a um, they are currently, they're still a part, a part of the U.S. Navy that's involved with a lot of uh, construction and logistical work. They're the ones that are going out constructing uh, bases and airfields and they're kind of like the, the they're the hands-on construction crew, the construction arm of the U.S. Navy. And this, the gentleman in this interview was stationed on Tinian in 44 and 45. And they was responsible for constructing the two major airfields, north and south fields. And one day, uh, him and his men are given the order of, you, know, you need to expand the north field, you need to lengthen the runway, you need to add these other structures and other features. And after completing the work, they were told, you need to evacuate the island. All the Navy Seabees were pushed out of Tinian and onto a neighboring island beside the hand. And they thought this was kind of odd, but um, a Another ship comes in at that time, or later in the week, the USS Indianapolis, and another and a fleet of B-29 uh, bombers and other new aircraft. Well, they'd only realized a couple days later, the B-29 that was taking off from the North Field was the Enola Gay. And if you remember your World War, your World War II history, the Enola Gay was carrying the atomic bomb that was dropped from Hiroshima. And they were told, he was told later, in this other, uh, um, 
government and its group, they were told to evacuate the island because there was some kind of malfunction or some accident. They didn't want any man on the island to be hurt by the bomb. Well, if the bomb malfunctioned and exploded on the island, it would have instantly killed anyone who was on Tinia because of its relatively small size. But it was kind of interesting. He had no idea it would be connected to such a dramatic event in US, and not just US history, but world history. So I was definitely not expecting that when I heard that interview. But how exactly does this oral history processing a procedure work? The inter you get the interview, and what exactly do you do with it in terms of the Eisenhower Library? Well, the interviews are first received, are received them in a FedEx envelope, and they consisted of four important components. It's the, a CD or DVD copy, which is a visual copy of the interview, an eight millimeter tape, which is an audio portion, the transcript, which has already been, uh, which is just a, uh, which is the, trans the transcription of the interview itself, and most importantly, the release form. So all four of these come with, uh, come with, come within each envelope, and then each one is assigned. Uh, first off, it's assigned a specific uh, call number. So whatever, the same way you go to uh, when you're checking out a, a book in the library or you're going through or some archives. The oral history interviews are assigned their own set of call numbers. So, actually, these call numbers, the interviews were EL for Eisenhower Library, BOH for Video Oral History, Wilbur II, Donning to Part of Wilbur II Collection, and then whatever the next sequence. So, you one, two, three. So, this call number is assigned to every interview that's that's come that come comes in and is processed. So, then the next step is to actually sit down and listen to this and listen to the interview. So, uh, up in the, the upper left picture, I have the entire setup. I have a, a description log running in the background while listening to the interview, and. During this time, you're writing down any kinds of key phrases uh, or notes that are coming up uh, while you're listening to the interview. So if he mentions Pearl Harbor, you type down Pearl Harbor. If he mentions Saipan Tinian or you know, Guadalcanal, or even during their training when they're in uh, uh, camp, they're in Fort Hood or Fort Bliss or the uh, special mechanics school or engineering school they attended, those all form part of the uh, description portion of the interview. But the other other portions that are consisted of uh, technical information, such as the name name of the interviewee, date and date and place of the interview, uh, link of the interview, the format that comes in, whether it's on a, a tape or it comes on a DVD. So and then you add any special note to the bottom. So say there's you know, there's lots of static in this one section. Uh, there's, a brand, there's a large period of silence, or there's a, a cutoff, or there's some kind of editing that does with the video. You make those little special notes uh, in the description. So, then after all of that's done, the transcript is given its own folder assigned the same call number, and the call number applied to both the tape and to the CD. And the release form actually goes to its own separate folder. It's, it requires its own power. Special portion of there. And of course, there I am at my workstation, uh, plugging away at the interview. So, this is the uh, O'Brien interview, and this is a another gentleman who served with the Merchant Marine uh, you know, in the uh, Atlantic. So, he was telling stories about how they were running drills, about how to avoid uh, you know, the how to be lookout for for German submarines and how to. What, what happens in the case of the merchant, the merchant marine convoy Iran is is sunk. They have a protocol for what happens, you know, during such an emergency. So. But after you, all these interviews are processed, they're now part of the library collection. But in all, what is their importance of such interviews? You know, why has why has Mr. Todd gone?